about the progression of computing from desktop to laptop to mobile, now what you're starting to see is robotics uh, enter into the fray. And really, if you think about it, that's spurred by one of the key consumer trends, which is the ability to talk to your devices. And what's ironic about that is it's actually, it's a throwback to an original consumer uh, trend, which was just talking to each other, right? So uh, I, think, I think it's kind of come full circle in that sense. But what I think robotics really does is it, it takes that wall that's between you and your environment, that cell phone, and gets rid of it, right? And so the interactions that you can start to have become very meaningful in a way that it isn't about you having to go pull out a device, start to search. Uh, it's just having a conversation. So that's, I think, if you're hearing one of the themes across the board here, you're going to hear that theme of speaking to your technology and getting value back from it. And is that, okay. is that solving a problem in robotics? Ultimately, the evolution of systems like Alexa, like Google Assistant, is that making ultimately the, the adoption of robotics move more quickly and almost like a parallel path? Uh, I'll answer this real quickly and let them do it. I, I think what's great about Echo and Google Home is it's, it's making that trend be a lot more pervasive and it's moving along quite a bit more quickly. I think that the value of some of the form factors that you see from some of uh, the likes of these companies is um, it, it takes what is an inanimate object, which is very passive, and it turns it into a, a two-way um, proactive interaction. So Pepper can see you, Pepper can reach out to you, call you over, and deliver some sort of content, which has a lot of really interesting use cases. Yeah, and, and Dr. Kluwer, you've mentioned before that you feel we're about to enter a rapid growth phase of robotics, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your reasoning for that. Well, uh, from the examples that you've seen, but I think we're, the reason is is because we, it's not just about mobility, uh, but it is about the uh, artificial intelligence. Of course, this is not general AI, but specific AI. Uh, and I think you're seeing also a, a driving factor through media. Um, and so, in essence, we as scientists grew up seeing movies like Star Wars and seeing various representations of robots. Mm -hmm. And now a host of exponential technologies have been coming together to advance robotics. So it's not just the robot themselves, it's the AI, it's deep machine learning, it's the array of sensors that are out there, the ability for those sensors to see and hear. For instance, the, the studies with Pepper. I mean, I'm really am impressed with Pepper, and it's one of the, my uh, favorite innovations, by the way, because the, uh, the whole point of it is it does give presence. The whole thing about having arms and a face and seeing you um, is what we as a society want to see. We want to have presence, and, and, and for us, from the avatar sense, um, we think that's extremely important. And I look at avatars as a uh, basically a, a, a sister to robots, so that we're looking at uh, avatars as robots powered by human intelligence. And I distinguish a, ro a robot by itself need not have any intelligence. I mean, you could go back a couple thousand years and have an automaton that's mechanically uh, driven. Sure. Uh, so I always say a robot with AI or a robot with human mm -hmm. intelligence. Think about a conversation that you've had with Alexa. Um, you, I, you probably haven't, right? You, you tell Alexa to do something and uh, it's either music, yes, lights if you have those enabled, um, you know, some kind of home automation, or you ask a question of which most of the time today it says, uh, you know, I don't know the answer. I didn't understand the question that I heard. Mm -hmm. It's getting better. You can ask questions. I asked, um, is Ken Follett alive after I finished one of his books? And she said, yes. And I was like, wow, that's oh. really amazing. Yeah. So it's coming along. But, also um, great for Ken Follett. Yes. But, yeah, <laughs> it's good for him, yeah. And, and I also asked, where does he live? And it said London. And I got two one-word answers, which was totally unexpected. So, so things are coming along, and, and I'm, I'm impressed by that. But at the same time, you know, there's no conversation happening, and I don't even think there's a conversation happening in the next five years. So when you ask about short term, you know, we focused on uh, not having relay speak, and it's no problem to play speech um, and pretend like we can talk. The problem is that people walk up to it all the time. I drive it through the convention center, and they say, you know, hey, bring me a gin and tonic. <laughs> it's not going to bring, even though know, I understood it, I can't bring you a gin and tonic, and, right. and you know, it's just not going to do that. And so you end up setting an expectation way up here and then disappointing people. And we decided that, you know, in the, the Star Wars metaphor, we'd go R2-D2 instead of C-3PO. Just beeps and whistles, and it's cute, and, and maybe you don't understand it, and that's okay. Um, 
the other one I think is interesting, just if we're using science fiction metaphors, is Star Trek, which doesn't really have any robots. It's surprising in that particular show, but the, the ship as a whole talks to you. So that's much more like Alexa than embodying a robot. Well, it wasn't data. Although so eventually, no. eventually data really you have this. Yeah, you, you actually have two AIs. You have data, and then you have the holographic doctor yeah. who is an AI. And data's so. the evil twin as well. So. Yeah, oh, yes. Let's not forget about data's evil twin. Let's just talk about Star Trek for the next 45 minutes. We're going to turn into a Star Trek Westworld <laughs> I agree, but that's my whole point. Is yeah. is uh, and an AI training wasn't uh, a at all about conversation. It was about action. Right. Um, so in yeah. fact, if I <clears throat> want to train it to do a physical thing, the data from that, not from the conversation, and which is why, in fact, I push strongly for for avatars because I want to see robotics move forward. And the limitations that you just mentioned, I don't have at all. Right. So I, I if I put a human in in your robot. Um, uh, or in, in Pepper, they can have conversations with you all day long. Well, and the great thing about what you're doing is that machine learning uh, needs a lot, a lot of data. And so yeah. if, if you can actually get a lot of people in the, um, in the Vive and other systems like that are making it so that you could inhabit an avatar pretty well from home and pretty affordably, uh, if you can do that and then you collect data for five years, then I think you can really start to talk about conversations right. and interesting stuff. I've talked about stories before where um, there's a lot of robotics happening on the ISS in order to free up those menial tasks and, and free up astronauts' time to do uh, more experimenting and more things that require a human and less things that don't necessarily need a person to be doing. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really interesting if, if, you, if you think about the space station, um, you know, people have uh, at first this, this notion that, oh my God, what a fantastic, wonderful place to be on. It probably is. Um, but then you get past that and you say, well, what was it really like to live uh, and work on the space station? And the reality, it's not all glamour, it's not all fun, it's not, you know, get up in the morning and do science all day long. Um, in reality, it's much more like camping. You spend all of your time <laughs> taking care of where you live. Um, and the astronauts spend a tremendous amount of time doing chores, they're monitoring their environment, they're looking for where things are. Um, you may not realize that the space station uh, today is the size of like a six bedroom house. Uh, and it's a place where you switch out the entire family every six months, but you leave all the stuff behind. Which means that you know, when you get a new crew on board um, and you're told, hey, you need to go do this activity, go use this piece of equipment that's in this drawer. And they open the door and like, it's not here. So where is it? Well, somebody misplaced it, they didn't log where it went, and now you have to spend time searching for that. Um, so if you think about it, the space station in reality is a lot like our environments here on Earth. It's a place where we're trying to, to you know, remove all those unnecessary things that just waste too much of our time by trying to, to do things either autonomously with robots um, or with systems to help us offload these menial, repetitive, really frankly boring chores. And so one of the things that I'm very excited about as I look to the future is, you know, how can we build the systems can, that can do these things? Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have your complete general purpose um, you know, humanoid forearm robot. If we could do that, fantastic. But the reality is, even if we don't build that, there's still lots of things that you can do. And in fact, um, it's kind of interesting the way we're kind of set up here. We have sort of like the humanoid robotics end, ends on the spectrum, and then Steve and I have certainly worked on robots, so I shouldn't say not just Steve, because Steve used to actually work with a robot that was, was quite humanoid in appearance. But, <laughs> but the point is that there are lots of different forms of robots, and in fact, I think Steve alluded to this too, that can do things very productively. And I think that more important than, than sort of just the basic form of the robot is really, you know, how resilient is it? Um, how reliable is it? I think any consumer out there, or frankly any astronaut, is not going to want to use a system if it breaks down all the time, mm -hmm. or if they can't predict how it's going to function. It needs to, to, to operate well, it needs to interact with you in a way that's efficient, and frankly, it needs to be something that you can just rely on. <laughs>